what up, what up? Welcome to another another episode of Musician Rewind. Guest today is Mr. William Prez Bush, ranger, composer, producer, and artist. What up, Will? Yo, what's going on, man? Thanks for coming on. We're going to jump right into it. Talk to another Queens cat. So, Prez, was keyboard your first instrument? Well, yeah, but I started on the organ. Okay. And this was like back in, I, I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Oh, okay. In Bridgeport, mm-hmm. Connecticut, if you want to play any kind of keyboards, you got two choices. It was the accordion or the organ. <laughs> the and there was no way, no way that I was going to play the accordion. There. <laughs> and, and to be honest with you, I, when we first moved up to, um, Bridgeport, my brother got offered free organ lessons. Mm-hmm. And you know how kids are, like, you know, one gets something and now you want it. Right. So I wanted the same thing. So we got a month of free lessons each. Okay. And then after that, we're supposed to take a test. You could take a test for your aptitude or something. And I think I scored like a hundred or something like that. Wow. So you know, I just kept, and I liked it, so I just kept going. My brother was like, nah, I'm out. So what age was that? Um, Seven. Okay. Yep, I was seven, started playing the organ. And uh, when we moved back to Queens, um, I had to find, I couldn't find an organ teacher. I found a piano teacher. Mm-hmm. And so I started playing, you know, the piano, which is really, I mean, it's, it's key, uh, you know, keyboards, but it's kind of two different instruments. Right. So it was very different for me because you can hold a note down on an organ forever. Right. Right. A piano is going to die out. So you had, it was a different set of chops that, that I had to, to work on. But um, little by little, you know, I, you know, I kind of got used to it and I started playing in bands and, you know, the rest is history. Right. So, okay. So you moved back down to Queens. He said seven, somewhere around that age. No, I, um, I was up, we moved up to Bridgeport when I was seven. Okay. When I was back, what age? 12, 13, we moved back down junior high school. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Was there, you were taking any music in school? Was you? No, no, no. There was no music in, no music lessons in school. It's just, you know, Saturday, Saturday morning, that's when I have my lesson. Saturday, I think like Thursday or something like that. So, and, and you went to what junior high school in Queens? 192. Linden Junior High School, 192. 192. I know the number. I just don't remember where it was. It's, it was on um, uh, Hollis Avenue. Oh, okay. By Hollis and... Um, uh, Hollis and... Uh, Francis Lewis, like a block or so over from that. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yep. So you wasn't required to play, to take any music in, in junior high school? In junior high school, when we moved back to Queens, you had, you, you had a choice to do electives. And I was into art, so I took the oh, art. Okay, elective, got you. Right? And although halfway through the year, well, they felt because I was pretty good at art. Mm-hmm. So, but I wanted to be in the in music. So I wanted to switch over to band. And I'm pretty certain that the art teacher, who to this day I'm kind of still in touch with, my art teacher from junior high school. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that he kind of schemed up with the uh uh with the band teacher. Uh, Mr. Williams, uh, because he wanted me to stay in art. Okay. So I asked if I could go to band. And when I got to band, Mr. Williams said, oh, yeah, you can be in the band. The only thing we got is a tuba. (laughs) 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 So I was like, oh, man. So I was there for like maybe a week. And then I ended up back in my art class. And that for... Um, for that year, that was the senior year of, you know, in junior high school, I had to do this mural. 
Mm. And it's, I did it and they put it in like right when you walk in, in the front door, I had this big mural, uh, Martin Luther King's March on Washington, the, um, uh, the sit-in at the, the lunch counter mm-hmm. and then um, having to ride the back of the bus. So that stayed there for like 20 years. Wow. Something like that. Nice. Yeah. Cause so, so I was known more for art than music. And when I was younger, I, I had wanted to be an architect. Oh, okay. Yeah. The art types like Richard Ruaz was an excellent artist. But, you know, I didn't know was, that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Okay, so now junior high school. So when when did you play in the first first band around the way? Around the way, that was in junior high school. That one year that I was in junior high school, I met uh, this kid, uh, Mark Skeet. And, and he went on later on. Uh, he was known in the industry as Mark Sex because he was a part of this group, No Face, mm-hmm. with Ed Lover. Okay. And and uh, Sean Trone, Shah. Um, but we were in the same art class. So lucky for me, I transferred back to my art class. Um, we met in art class and they were looking for a keyboard player. And he asked me one, one question. He said, can you play the solo to rock with you? Michael Jackson's rock with mm-hmm. you. And I was like, yeah. And I could. It was just not, it wasn't a hard solo. Right. So I could. And so I was in. Wow. I was in. That's all it took. It wasn't really an audition <laughs> or whatever. And so we were the youngest because I was 13 at the time. He mm-hmm. was 14. Um, the oldest person in the band was like 21, 22. Mm-hmm. Then there was like a 19 year old. The bass player was 19 years old, Errol Crosdale. Um, and everybody else was, you know, coming out of junior high school or in first year of high school or whatever. Right. Yeah. So we didn't know what we were doing, but we were having a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't. And, so, okay. So the house, when I met you, the house you were living in, is that way when y'all moved back, that was the, the house? Yeah. Well, see, we always had the house. Mm-hmm. My, my, my grandmother was always there to take care of us and she wanted to move to Bridgeport. Okay. So we moved with her because both my parents worked. Right. So we would go back and forth, you know, technically we lived in Bridgeport, but every weekend we're da- back down in Queens, you know, so we always had that house that, that you're familiar right. with. Okay. That corner yeah. house. Right. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, I know, you know, once I didn't know anybody on that side of town until Paul, cause me and Paul went to the same high school. Well, from, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and so once I got thinking, the next person I knew was Julio. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, when I started coming on that side and I realized how many musicians was over there. I was, all of the significant cats were like a little bit older than me. Right. So like High Fidelity, Frankie Carr, all those cats. Right. They were like ahead of me. So I, I came like okay. after them. So I knew about a lot of those people, but I never met them. It's like, and you're right. There were so many musicians in that one yeah. little area, mm-hmm. you know? So you kept hearing names and then you wanted to know them because they were the people to know, you know, I met, eventually I met Caleb, mm-hmm. Caleb James. Um, and so then I met uh, Billy Grant, uh, a couple other cats and everything, but I was always like, just younger, a little bit younger right. than, than they were. So it was a different kind of... And see, because I started so early, I mean, we were playing in nightclubs. I was 13, yeah. we were playing in nightclubs. But I was so young, I couldn't hang out the mm-hmm. way the other musicians could hang out. I had to be home. Right. Yeah, you know? we pretty much were the, were the same way playing those spots um, when we wasn't old enough to be there. But, you know, the, the rule was stay away from the bar. <laughs> I know. The, <laughs> the, they used to Owner say, you know right. what? You Yeah, you could play here, right. but when you're not on stage, I better not see you. Yeah, we had to stay in the dressing room. Don't go to the bar. Don't go to the bar at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and so that was an experience in in itself. Yeah, because I know I didn't meet you too much later. I know. Way much, much later, yeah. So because... um. 
I knew Caleb and and a lot of cats. I didn't know where they were actually from, uh, because they used to be up at the music building. Yes. So that's when I really didn't know who lived where. But you know, I knew Julio from that side of town. Tony, uh, Tony McLaughlin. There were like so so many, right? Musicians coming through, and you know, like on any, you could just walk down the block. Yeah, because you know, Arnie Reynolds was up further up towards Jackson, but Arnie Reynolds yeah. over there, and um, you know, I started to meet a lot of a lot of those cats. So okay, so then we had the band era. When did you start getting to the whole recording? Well, I started the same way that everyone did with with two tape recorders. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I got into a band, I, oh, I had like a little tape recorder. On, I had one of those or, home organs, mm-hmm. and there was a tape recorder on there. And I started using that, and I found I could plug another instrument into the back of this organ. And so I could record stuff. And I got like a little drum machine or borrowed a drum machine. And so as, as soon as I got into bands, I started doing that. Um, then I got, you know, people wanted me to start, you know, putting little tracks together for them. Mm-hmm. And so I would either I would buy a piece of gear or if someone, I was famous for, helping you figure out your gear. But okay. when I help you figure it out, you gotta let me hold it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, people would just get gear and they didn't know how to to do anything with right. it. So I would take it and I would learn it and I show them how to do it, but then I'd hold on to it. And then I, I'd hold on to it for so long that it felt like it was mine. <laughs> and then one day they would come and get it. It's like, oh that's right, it's not mine. Your catch didn't want to. They didn't want to read manuals. <laughs> no, they didn't. They didn't. So I, I mean, I benefited from that because you know I could figure stuff out, and so I I would have this setup. I have a recording setup, and this is in like high school now. So I'd have a recording setup, and like half the stuff wasn't even mine. Mm. You know, um, and so I was doing it. So now we get into like the beginning of college that I only went to one year college. I went to, to Baruch. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was like, this is really not for me. I had a full scholarship too. Do art Um, or music? No, just, you know, academic scholarship or something like that, but it just wasn't for me. It was so much structure. And what I found like school was easy. Mm. Being playing music was not. It was way more challenging. So I wanted to do that because it's like, you know, I got straight A's. And like I said, I had a full scholarship, all this kind of stuff. But music, you had to really, it was not easy, man. It was not easy at all. And it was more challenging. So you had to be creative just just to move ahead. Um, So that one year of college was when I really started getting into recording. And I went to, I went to college with the guy, um, Stephen Kitt. He he uh, he wrote the theme song for Martin. Oh, okay. So we went to school together. And I met him in the practice room over at Baruch College, because that's where I went. You know, so I, that for that one year, that was enough school for me. And I just, you know, really got into the music. And that's when I met. Around that time, I met Paul Frawley, Uncle Funky, mm-hmm. and then Theory. They were both, you know, they had recording setups and everything. And I would listen to Theory stuff. And I'm like, yo, this stuff sounds good. Mm-hmm. And I would ask him questions. I was, I would always ask questions. Um, every time I went into the studio, somebody else's studio, I'd be the first one there and the last one to leave and asking questions and just watching. Sometimes... You know, they don't want you to really ask questions because they're busy. Right. So I just sit there and watch. But I, you know, I felt comfortable asking Theory, yo, man, how did you get your recordings to sound so good? And after that, it was just, I was always chasing, trying to get that good sound, good sound, good sound. And keep trying to make it better and better. 
Um, and that was really the beginning when I was list, got to listen to other people, mm. what they were doing in the studio. It's like, man, I want my stuff to sound as good as that. Yeah, Theory stuff was always clean, even for cassette it was. tape. It, it was. was. It's always clean. It was, yeah. I was, and he would, you know, he was like very, very nonchalant about it. He said, oh man, it's easy. All you got to do. Yeah. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. that's easy for you to say because you don't know how to do it, you right. know? And I had to figure it out, but I, you know, I figured it out. And, and, um, Paul, he was, he was like very helpful, mm-hmm. you know, um, he let me hold some stuff or just, you know, watch what he was doing and everything. So the cool thing about that time and I, to me, I think in Jamaica, Queens, in that, that area, everyone was competitive, but everybody also helped each other out, mm-hmm. yep. you know, because I remember, you know, auditioning, going on auditions and, oh man, I needed a keyboard. And, you know, I hung out with Burt Price and a few other keyboard players. And if you needed a keyboard, okay, use mine. But we're going for the same audition. Yeah. So, I mean, there were so many cats. I remember one time because Paul was around the corner from me. And theory at that time, theory was was living over there, too. Okay. Um, Julio used to be a couple blocks down with Davey DMX. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so there was another, somebody else had a, a studio in the other direction. So we would just end up at each other's studios, just hanging out. And then people would ask you, well, how did you do that? And you would tell them, there's not like really a secret. Right. You would tell them and then you go to their studio and you ask them, how did you do that? And they show you. Yeah. You think know? Greg moved into the area? Oh, Greg yeah, Lawrence. Greg. You know, yeah, he became like Studio Central over there. I uh, know. I used to pick in. his. I used to pick his brains, man. Always somebody there. Always yep. somebody over there. You could always just stop in there and, and yeah, because Greg, like, yeah, you could come and just ask Greg, or just sit and watch. Yeah, he How was. He stuff. would. He would sit for hours telling you about stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he was always this all because he was a little bit older mm-hmm. than me. And he he always seemed to be plugged into something. And my thing was, I wasn't plugged into anything, you know, but like maybe I knew somebody's cousin who played in such and such as band. Right. You know, but I didn't know such and such. I didn't know that person, you know, and I was like, man, I got it. I got to get a little more connected in there, you know, but it, it was cool because you were around people who were actually doing something. Mm-hmm. And so it made me feel like, well, if they can do it, I might be able to do it too. If I can be in the same room with that, I always thought if I can be in the same room with that person, then I can probably do what they do. Yeah. That, Wait, so when, when did you start writing? Like what, what clicked on, you know, for you to start writing? I started writing like instrumental stuff on the piano. Mm. And, and as a matter of fact, I got to make a distinction. In the beginning, I loved the electric piano. I didn't care about the acoustic piano. Right. I didn't care for the sound of it at all. But the electric piano, when I heard um, Billy Joel's Just the Way You Are, mm-hmm. yeah, I fell so. in love with the electric piano. Now, before that, Slightly before that, I had, when I was still living in um, Bridgeport, Connecticut, I heard Stevie Wonder, mm. uh, Songs in the Key of Life. And that's when I wanted to play keyboards, really, right. you know. But I didn't even know what a synthesizer was. I didn't understand any of that stuff. And so I started writing songs on, on the piano. And when I finally got an electric piano or access to an electric piano, because I didn't get my own electric piano until about 1984. Mm-hmm. I got a, a Rhodes, a Mark II or something like that. But this was just when uh, the DX7 came out. So they were, oh, okay. yeah. they were giving them away. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just started writing on the piano. And when I got keyboards, I started just putting tracks together, no lyrics. Right. 
so it was just, I was just coming up with tracks and I wasn't interested in writing lyrics at all. And that's how I kind of, I guess, made my little name. Like I could come up with tracks for mm-hmm. anything. You right. Know? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. So um, now just going back a little bit, when you was doing organ, were you into like Billy Preston? Because I know he was like the man organ wise. See, Lucky I wasn't Peterson. even, a, <laughs> oh man, I wasn't even aware of Billy Preston because, mm-hmm. okay, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, okay, there was AM radio back then. And so what I heard on the radio, I heard rock, I heard the, the Rolling Stones, I heard Helen Reddy, I heard mm-hmm. Captain Antonio. So I dug him, I dug the captain. Right. You know, which ironically, people don't realize how much Tony Tennille was like, if you saw them in concert, she was playing left hand right. bass, mm. playing the chords and singing. And mm. then the captain was over there playing his synthesizer part. Right. But she was like holding it down. I didn't know it at the time. Right. But um, so I didn't know Billy Preston other than the hits that he had that made it onto, you know, pop radio. So, right. you know, will it go around in circles and, and mm-hmm. uh, nothing from nothing. So I really wasn't hyper aware of like different keyboard players or, or even like, musicians i remember of course there was stevie wonder at some point and then i remember seeing a picture of parliament funkadelic Mm -hmm. and they had this crazy gear on they looked like they were from another planet and i remember that's the first time that i was really aware of like musicians as personalities or whatever Mm -hmm. characters characters yeah Mm -hmm. yeah yeah my my sister, my older sister, rest in peace. Uh, she turned me on to Parliament. Well, what made me fall in love with being a keyboard player was seeing all those keyboards stacked up. Mm. And I remember I saw a picture of Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> yeah, I know the picture you're talking about. <laughs> I know the picture you're talking about. Yep. And I was like, what? He, the whole back of the stage was just filled with keyboards. keyboards. And I was like, that's what I want. I don't care if I'm in the back as long as I'm surrounded. And to this day, I ha- I cannot, like, cats want to, like, roll out real simple and mm-hmm. one keyboard. I can't do that. Mm-hmm. I can't do that. It's like, man, I, you know, if Larry <laughs> Dunn saw me now, he would. You know, I, I got to I got to represent. So I'll have like three, four, whatever amount of keyboards because that makes me feel good. You know, yeah. to see somebody nowadays with two keyboards is rare. <laughs> I know. And, and and they don't need it. You know, we you could. Well, no, no, you can't do it with just one keyboard. Right. If you're really serious about playing keyboards because one keyboard has a piano touch, mm-hmm. there's another keyboard that has an organ touch. And then you want to play your string lines or synth lines. You want mm-hmm. them to feel a certain way. So just to have the different feels that you need is right. like the same way with different symbols. It's the same thing. So I couldn't, I wouldn't want to play on just one keyboard. And I get it. You can map it out. So, you know, yeah. at the very top, you got your strings, you got your piano and bass and blah, 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 blah. But to me, that's not fun. Yeah. And again, how music earlier on was orchestrated. You you kind of had to have because there was clavinet, there was Rhodes, there was organ, and then when the string ensemble came out, I mean, really, if you was playing something that had that, you had to have all of those keyboards. You did. You you really did. And and remember, nobody could ever afford that Yamaha Electric Grand. Right. That was like thousands of dollars. Yeah. So. I never played one, but there was this keyboard, the RMI electric piano. And that's the closest that you were going to get to an acoustic kind of sound at that point in time. It was an awkward thing because the the top was slanted. Mm -hmm. So you something on top of it. You'd have to like work, figure something out. I'm glad I came up during that era because I understand how to create sounds, synthesize. 
you know, as opposed to just presets, mm-hmm. you know, which, so which it was harder call, back. They, it, which they kind of called, well, I, I guess programmers, sound yeah. designers nowadays. Yeah. But everybody had to be a programmer back then. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. And it was interesting because I, I can remember watching Midnight Special and you would see those guys with the Moogs and they'd be doing it right there, you know, real time. Turning the knobs while they're holding a note and stuff. Yeah. I used to watch, um, well, I didn't discover George Duke Mm -hmm. for quite some time. I was just playing, you know, and when I finally discovered him, I was like, wait a minute, that's exactly what I want to do. Cause he would, he could play jazz. He could play funk. He had pop, you know, um, Mm -hmm. with the Clark Duke project you know, whatever. He was like all over the place, but he did everything really well. And it was authentic. Right. It was authentic. And I would watch like videos. I forget. There was a, a, a television show that would come on during the daytime. It was like on PBS or something, soundstage or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I used to like watching that because you would see real musicians in real time doing it. And you would see, right these cats on the, you know, on the keyboards and they're like, like you said, holding the note. All of a sudden now the note sounds completely different. Mm-hmm. Playing you know, with I those waves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, was, it was interesting. Yeah. I remember that Sawtooth. I remember I had a book on electronic music and that's what they were talking about, the different yep. waves. Yeah, and it was all pretty, it was pretty simple until the DX7 came along. And that kind of changed everything because then you had access to even more waveforms. Right. For that, which, it was which most stupid. people, again, like you said, if they weren't doing into what you were doing, they were just hitting the buttons. Yeah. Like, you know, nobody would uh, kind of customize their own thing. Um, you know, I know a few keyboard players that they would have a DX7 and but people would be going, yo, how, where you get that sound from? You know, it was it was always there if you took the time. Yeah. Because the DX7 was so hard to program, mm-hmm. that, to me, that was the beginning of people just dealing with presets. And, right. it, I mean, it came along at the time. I think you had 32 presets on the DX7. That was it. Mm-hmm. Later on, like the Juno 60, the you know, the rolling stuff would come out. Right. and And I think that got to... The Juno 60, they had, had, I think, more presets than the Juno 108 had, like, 100 presets or something like that. But didn't they always have, even on the DX7, didn't it have a user bank? It did. You got into programming your stuff and saving it? Yes, all Mm -hmm. of them did. Um, But the DX7 was the hardest one to program Mm -hmm. because it was a different, it was a different structure. So... If you knew how to program, you know, a, a mini mode or something, right? It didn't help you in programming a DX7. You had to like learn a different kind of procedure, right? You know, but they had, you know, the DX7 had these like sounds that we couldn't get with the other keyboards, you know. So they it was here to stay. That that, that changed everything, especially with that electric piano sound. That's wow. that that put the the roads. And the world is sort of out of, you know, mm-hmm. they, they, there was, that was no longer the hot ticket. You just had, all you needed was that, uh, a DX7 and look how light that was. Right. Yeah. I was going to say, to so, so no longer, uh, that you had to carry that heavyweight roads around. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, okay. In high school, they, I had a, the band I was in Oasis too. You had a bunch of wise guys, man. They're like, okay, everyone got to carry their own gear. I'm like, yo. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I was stubborn. So I figured out a way to carry a rose. I would put it on my back. Dang. Because, uh, you know, they, they would mess around. And I'm like, right. okay, fine, I'll carry it. And, I, and I, I figured out a way to do it. It wasn't the smartest thing to do. But, yeah. Yeah, Press. So, when did you start recording, like for um, name artists and producing them? Well, it was kind of like a gradual thing. Um, I think it started from, you know, going out on the road with people, 
And so, you know, now I'm rubbing elbows with people mm-hmm. and any of the artists that I would, um, that I was playing live with, I would let them know, Hey, I, you know, yeah. I can do tracks or whatever. And I play them stuff. And so eventually somebody would say, you know, why don't you come over? You know, we're home for a little while. Come over and let's work on some stuff. Independently, I knew um, I was working with this this group called No Face, who Mm -hmm. No Face came out of this band I was playing in, Oasis 2. Right. So Ed Lover was in Oasis Mm -hmm. 2. Mark Sex was in Oasis 2. And Sha, um, they were the three guys in No Face. And I would do all of their records. So okay. that was for Def Jam. And mm. so I would start doing a lot of, you know, just rap stuff. And they got their own label and they started producing, they produced this uh, female rap group called BWP. Mm-hmm. And I did that whole album. Um, but I'm just, you know, the keyboard player. And then I started working with this other group, the Live Squad. And that's how I ended up working with um, Tupac. Okay. So it was just like, and we all used to work up at um, 1212 in the music building, the recording studio up there. And, and so, yeah. Hey, so which I, building? Queens or Manhattan? In Queens. Okay. The music building, because they had uh, Mitch. Mitch had his uh, a really great 24-track studio up there. And um, so... You know, little by little, I'm just always there. I was the musician mm-hmm. in the room. And um, an, another friend of mine, uh, she used to sing back up for Benny King. Okay. And so this is around like 1989, 1990, around 91, 92, really. And, uh, you know, I gave, she told me that Benny King was looking for an engineer. Mm -hmm. for his home studio. So I gave him a tape of some stuff that I did. And then he ended up calling me. He said, well, who did this music? Mm -hmm. And I said, I did. He said, well, I need you to do some demos for me. And then those demos ended up being on his next album. So everything was just like word of mouth. And then, like I said, with the No Face, the Def Jam stuff, that put me with all the the hip hop, the rap stuff. Um, And then... I was out on the road with Lisa Lisa and Cult Jam and she called me up one day and she said, yeah, this guy uh, needs somebody to produce this new artist. I said, well, who's the guy? She said, one of the, one of the guys from um, TKA, Tony, um, Tony Ortiz. Mm -hmm. And he had this artist, uh, Jay Quest. And so they came to my studio and we started working on one tune. And that tune helped him get signed. And to promote that album, they put that one tune on the soundtrack to Jason's lyric. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, so that was just, you know, that was just kind of, I always say it's like you just have to be in the right place at the right time. Right, right. But that means that sometimes you got to be in a lot of places that end up being nowhere. But Mm -hmm. you just got to be out there. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Eventually, something is is going to click. Maybe because they, you know, they see you enough times. It's like, well, what does he do? I keep seeing mm-hmm. this guy, yeah. and then, you know, you yeah. just you start networking. And like you said, you got to let people know what you do. I know I had to find that out. I got a call like maybe at ten o'clock at night from this artist that I had done something with. Um, no, actually, I didn't do anything. He just came over to my studio, so I met him. Mm-hmm. And out of the blue, he called me up, and he asked me, yo, you know how to play guitar? Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah. But there was some hesitancy in my voice because, I mean, I don't consider consider myself a guitar player, especially not then. Now I do, but back then, no. But I could play on my own stuff because I was playing, right. you know. Mm-hmm. And I said, what kind of session is it? He said, oh, it's a, it's a hip-hop session. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I <laughs> right. How hard is that going to be? <laughs> so uh, he said, well, 
we're having a session right now. How soon can you get over to um, Battery Studio in Manhattan? So I said, I'll leave now. And I got there and it was Chico DeBarge was the producer. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know it was Chico DeBarge because he he had cut his hair and everything. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't recognize him. And they were calling him something else. He has another nickname and they were calling him something else. And so I didn't put two and two together. And he looked like, a, he just looked like a Puerto Rican guy from Harlem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what he looked like. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he said, yeah, I need this kind of flamenco thing. Mm-hmm. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he knew exactly what he wanted. Yeah. So what I had to do, you know, I went into the, um, into the live room and they had two, uh, two microphones set up for the guitar. And I brought my own guitar, uh, an ovation. And I was having a, a problem doing it. So I turned my back so they couldn't see what I was doing. And I, I retuned the guitar mm. so that the only thing that I could do was play that line. Right. If you wanted me to play something else, I wouldn't be able to do it because the guitar was not. Right. And, you know. It tuned different. Yeah. And, I mean, it was. I remember the AC was on high, (laughs) but I was sweating bullets. (laughs) I was sweating bullets because, you know, now it's like midnight. They called me at 10 o'clock. I said, yes, I can do this. So now I'm there and I have no choice. I'm going to have to deliver. Right. I got to play the line or the lines, whatever they wanted me to do. And so I was like, "If, if I mess this up, Cause halfway through the session, that's when I realized, oh, wait a minute, this is Chico DeBarge. And that didn't help. Right. That did not help at all. He's real but, cool though. Yeah, he was. He was. And then afterwards he said, Okay, let me put you on another track and just just improvise through the whole song. And so I did that. Mm-hmm. Um and eventually it came out. Uh I heard my improvisation stuff mm-hmm. and I th- I don't know. I, I I didn't think that I sounded that good playing the other parts. So I'm like, maybe he got somebody else to play it because I don't think I sounded that mm-hmm. good. But you never know. Right. You know, maybe I did sound that good. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. Right. To me, like when you're in the middle of it, your perception is one thing in reality. Yeah, it's exactly. Different. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But you know, let the person that hired you always be the judge. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's it's right. It's up to them what they like. Yeah, and don't waste your time trying to correct them and say, oh, exactly. Is, you know, oh, you can do much better or something like that. Just say, it, you, you like this? All right. Then it is what you like. Yeah. Don't Especially like now when I was working with um with Tupac, well, for I was working with this producer Stretch. Now Stretch was with Tupac when he got shot over mm-hmm. at, the at the studio mm-hmm. at Quad. Mm-hmm. Now Stretch, he 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 would have to bend over to walk into a room. He was so oh, tall. tall. Wow. Yeah. Um, and when I was doing those hip hop sessions, I learned how to work really quickly mm. and try to do things in one take because they weren't really interested in, you know, me fixing a note. Right. Yeah. I learned mm. that the hard way because I'm like, oh man, let take me <laughs> back. So now we don't have time for that. <laughs> Just keep it. I'm like, right. oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. They- they work at they they own they own thing. Yo, how was it working with George Clinton? Well, I mean, I only did I did like one one show with him. Yeah, but I mean, how was that? Like, I have never seen someone control an audience like he did. Mm. He we were in um, Park City, Utah. Wow, Utah, that. Yeah, so. Um, and it was funny. We got there. It was me and um, Pearl. Mm-hmm, right. Um, and so we're the two keyboard players and a few other people from Parliament Funkadelic. Uh, and uh, Sheila Horn, she was actually the artist. Mm-hmm. And George was supposed to come in and do half the show. Um, and so I remember... He got there late, so we didn't even see him before the show. But I'm I'm on stage and I'm looking behind the drummer, and he kept sticking his head out. 
because the band was it it, it was kind of we were, we were laying something down. It was mm-hmm. it was pretty good, and so he was digging it. He kept sticking his head out, and he was supposed to come out like after the sixth song. Mm-hmm. He came out on like Red Hot Mama, <laughs> and he because he couldn't. He just had to get a piece. Yeah, I had to get out there. He had to get out there, and I'm so glad he did. He came out there and like for five minutes, he was just telling the audience what to do. Like the drummer was just doing four on the floor, right. you know, boom, boom, mm-hmm. boom. And he's telling half the audience to wave their hand and and, and yeah. bark and do this and everything. Yeah, and they did it. He, he, he like, he turned the audience into an instrument. Mm. And so I was like, oh man. And so, I remember they, for that gig, they called us up. They said, well, you know, what keyboards do you want? You can get two. And I was like, I named stuff that I already had. Right. But see, I had old stuff. They were like, no, we ain't got none of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, well, let me get, you know, whatever. But I got like the synthesizer action, the synth, you know, not a piano touch. Mm-hmm. And then Pearl... He was like, well, I'm going to get everything that I want. And he got the 88 version of everything, which if you're doing certain synth kind of things, you can't do it on a piano feeling keyboard. Mm, Right, right, right. And so, you know, we were set up right next to each other. And he said, man, this is hard to play. And I I was laughing at him. (laughs) We're on stage. And he said, never again. I said, yes, that's what you get for being greedy. (laughs) You know? Um, And so I was closest to the audience and as soon as george came out he walked right over to me and he did like this kind of like some finger action for me to to play right and so that was a moment for me you know because he i don't know he felt i could could play Mm -hmm. something at that moment in time so it's just me and him at the keyboard and he's like hovering over the keyboard and I'm playing and he's kind of directing me and everything. I thought that was pretty, you know, pretty cool. But he was like, that's old school. He just knew what he was doing. Yeah. And that's what you, it it was, cause that's an experience. You'll, you'll never forget that. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So, I mean, tell everybody what you doing, man, your own thing. Well, now I'm, uh, I'm doing most of, well, I'm starting to put out my own stuff. Well, I right. always have put out my own stuff, mm-hmm. but I always wanted to get into um, like more of a jazz kind of thing. Uh-huh. Uh, but I've always been doing, you know, pop or R&B, soul, whatever. Uh, but I wanted to start doing things for myself because I've been helping put other artists out, yeah. you know, yeah. um, producing. And a lot of times it's like, it's just me and that artist, right. nobody else. Maybe right. I, if I really need a good guitar player, I'm going to call, you know, John Willis, Guru right. Bishop. Mm-hmm. We'll call him or whoever. Everything else I can do. I can play bass. I can play guitar, whatever. But especially today, you don't know who produced a record today because right. they don't have those kind of credits. I'm like, well, if I want to make any kind of noise, I'm going to have to just be the artist. Yeah. And... And so I've been doing that. So the last year I've been doing like instrumental, like smooth jazz kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so now I'm getting ready to go back and do some more vocal stuff, but it's like kind of throwback um, to like the Ohio players, you know, that kind of era. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause I mean, that's, that's what I like to listen to. Right. And being that I'm not like a, I'm not 20 years old. I can do whatever I want now. I don't Yeah, they go I right. Yeah, you yeah, know. That, that that's what I tell the cats. I was like, "Look, man, today's technology, you could be heard around the world with a click of a button." I said, "Do what you want to do." I said, "You know, you you want to make whatever kind of music you want to make. There's always somebody that's going to like it somewhere." I said, and "That's the advantage we have now. You know, you could have a hit record in Thailand." Who cares? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then, and most of the people in our age group are not listening to that stuff either. They right. want to hear. They right. want to hear something from, you know, it could be new, 
Right. But they want to hear something that sounds like their heyday. But when you stop and think about it, look at it today, and let's go back to, say, 1977, 1979. You had the Commodores. You had Earth, Wind, and Fire. You had Rick James. You had the Ohio players. You had... Uh, I think the Gap Band was out somewhere around that The time. Gap Band, yes. Mm-hmm. The Gap Band. I'm trying to think of all the super groups. Yeah. Right? Because you had mm-hmm. other groups as well. Yeah. But you just had that, and nobody sounded similar. Exactly. Brainstorm. Right? I remember Goose Weasel was too. Yeah. But then mm-hmm. you also had Teddy Pendergrass. Mm-hmm. You also had Michael Jackson. You also had uh, Patti LaBelle. You had Stephanie Mills. You had... And that was like a musical rainbow. It's like all the right. colors of the rainbow right there. Right. right. So you couldn't get tired listening to radio. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Same way we went to a show. It was so diverse. It was like. Yeah. You know, like the super fest. Right. Mm-hmm. Super- yeah. Yeah. That was, but, that was a great thing about it. And, and even hip hop at that time. Oh, yes. They, you know, you would go and you could see 10 of them and nobody sound the same. You couldn't. As a, a good example, a very good example, you go to um, uh, Arsenio Hall's last show. Mm-hmm. Okay. He, he had I'm all the rappers on. Mm-hmm. He had Yo Yo, he had Queen Latifah, he had um, CL Smooth, he had uh, KRS One, who well, I worked with him too. Okay. Um, uh, he, that was an interesting thing. Um, but anyway, on that last uh, that last show, all these rappers, DOS effects, all these, and nobody sounded the same. MC Light was on it. Nobody sounded right. the same. You couldn't you could not get bored listening to hip hop. Everybody was trying to have their own voice. So I I really hope that we could get back to that. You know, because it it makes music so much more enjoyable now. I feel like it's more about if people get a vibe, that's it. We want we want a personality back in the day. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, because again, when you take the art and the creativity out of it, and it's all about money, it always it's always going to lose that. Right. It it doesn't have to be so glamorous and fancy right like you could okay you could do a big show and you you're not getting paid for it or you could do a little show and you get paid for it and you sold cds or you sold merchandise you Mm -hmm. sold whatever and you make a ton of money that way but yeah so do you have like a website something you could drop people could find you yeah you can go to um uh funkyprez.com Okay. And, uh, you know, so I got a bunch of music there and I'm going to start doing some live shows coming up. Okay. Uh, I'm going to start do, doing some uh, like singer songwriter mm-hmm. nights at different places. Right. I'm not really interested in doing covers. I mean, I, yeah. I do it yeah. to, to make money. But at some point, the Commodores were an independent band. You know, and I'm name. I'm only naming like you know mm-hmm. from back in the day, but D'Angelo, you name it, whoever's right. Everybody was independent, independent at some point, right. right? And then people dug their music. But you, you have to, you have to stick with it. So I'm trying to create um, avenues and opportunities for new artists to perform their music. Nice, you know, yeah. and and just unapologetically. Just be whatever they're going to be. Right. Yeah. You know, because then we sometimes we get surprised. Like, I didn't think people would like that. Well, and you got to give them a chance. You know, and, and that's my thing. Stop making a, you know, decide for what people are going to like and let them tell you. If you have a bad show, this we're just talking mm-hmm. about shows. If you have a bad show and there's like, let's say, 100 people there and you just like you tanked. Well, guess what? They're probably not going to really remember you. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to worry about that. They'll never come to another one of your shows ever again. So you don't have to worry <laughs> about that. Right. But next time you're like, okay, I did this wrong. I did that wrong. Mm-hmm. Next time you get it together, you have a good show. Right. Those people will remember you right. and they're going to come back. So 
I mean, you can't, you win some, you lose some, right. but it can't, you can't like preempt your opportunity. Right. You know, yeah. give yourself a chance to, to shine or, or fly or, or fall. Yeah. And when you fall, you just get back up. Right. And, but you know, like you said, the first thing though, you gotta be doing it though. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yo, man, thanks for coming on. I uh, appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, man. It was nice catching up. Definitely. So, yeah, y'all check Prez out. Go to the site. Check out his music. He's got great stuff. And, uh, yo, Prez, thanks again, man, for coming on. And right. I will see y'all on the next episode of Musician Rewind. We out.